Amen. <laughs> okay. That probably wasn't the most pastoral thing in the world to say, but that's how I feel sometimes when I'm sitting in those meetings. Um, all right. If you got your Bibles with you, please join me in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. So on Wednesday nights, we began our study on the book of James uh, a couple weeks ago. And right right off the bat in that book, uh, after the first verse where he introduces himself, immediately in verse 2, he says, Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. He wastes no time. He just gets right to the heart of the matter. And one of the things we discussed was that uh, despite some of the false teachings out there, being a Christian does not exempt us from trials. Right. Being a Christian does not exempt us from, from suffering, from difficulties. Um, that, that, that is just simply false teaching when anybody says, come to Jesus and everything will get better. <laughs> well, your soul will get better. Mm-hmm. Um, your mind will get better. You, know, you as, as a person will begin to get better in Christ, but it, it doesn't mean that everything around you is going to begin to get better. It doesn't mean all of the trials and difficulties go away. As a matter of fact, being a Christian will bring trials in your life. Uh, I I have gone through difficulties I never went through until I became a Christian. Uh, People you think that are your friends begin to turn on you, family begins to turn on you, all sorts of things start to change when you proclaim the name of Jesus Christ when you begin to live righteously, when you begin to stand against error, um, yeah, just being a Christian will bring these things into your life. But the good news is we are not left without hope or instruction. I mean, what, what, what a terrible place it would be if we come to Jesus and Jesus just sort of said, okay, deal with it as best you know how, and we'll see you when you get home. Yeah, that, that would be terrible, wouldn't it? Uh, I I love what Paul wrote in Romans 15. Now, he was referring to the Old Testament. We have the benefit of both the Old Testament and the New. But the Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, said this. He said, For whatever was written in earlier times, that is the Old Testament, was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. How many of you know this book gives hope in so many different ways? It gives instruction in life. It's given us everything we need for for faith and life and hope and instruction. It's given us us all of it. Uh, So the question is, it's not, you know, when it's not if trials are going to come, it's when, right? It's not if suffering and and difficulty is going to happen, it's when. It's like the, the wise pastor once said. You're in one of three places. Either A, you're in a storm. B, you just came out of a storm. Or C, you're headed towards one. It's it's one of those three. So so what do we do? What what do we do when trials come our way, when difficulties come our way, when specifically suffering for our faith comes our way? Specifically suffering for our faith comes our way. Well, we come to a very, very popular story today, a very popular account of the Apostle Paul. Uh, the title of today's message is Praises at Midnight. Praises at Midnight. Uh, because that's what we're going to see. And there are uh, six timeless truths I want, I want to share with everybody today that we can apply. So if you're going through something today, no matter how small, no matter how big, no matter uh, where, where it falls in the range of difficulty of what you're facing, uh, I believe these are things you can apply. We can immediately take them uh, away with us. So I want to share that with you today. Uh, And we will begin with just an incredibly uh, fast recap where uh, the Apostle Paul and his missionary team of Luke and Timothy and Silas, they uh, ended up in Philippi. God led them to the district of Macedonia. You remember, he said no to Asia, or rather he said not yet to Asia, no to Bithynia. He leads them to Macedonia. They go to uh, a place of prayer by the river. We met Lydia, Paul shared the gospel, God gave her understanding, gave her the gift of repentance, uh, and she and her household was born again, and they were baptized. And uh, she gave them a place to stay, she fed them. Hospitality to missionaries is always good. 
It's always good. Uh, so we left off on a really high note. I mean, this is just wonderful. The church at Philippi was planted. So many things God in his sovereignty has accomplished. And uh, so we pick up in verse 16. What is that squeaking? Okay. Verse 16. That, that was horrifically distracting. Um, verse 16. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, in other words, they continued meeting by the river, right? They continued meeting with Lydia in the household for the place of prayer. A slave girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out saying, these men are bond servants of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. Okay, lesson number one. If we're going to uh, become serious about living the Christian life, if we're going to uh, begin to not just talk about it, but live it in the workplace, at home, and all other places, uh, number one, expect resistance. Just go ahead and expect it. Uh, because the Bible is very clear about this. Uh, Paul told Timothy, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's not if, it's not you might, it's you will. It's just a matter of time. So not long after rejoicing with Lydia and her household and the salvation that, that took place, the, this wonderful prayer meeting, here comes Satan. Here he comes, like clockwork. And this time he is coming uh, and, and, and using uh, a demon-possessed girl. And it says that uh, in verse 16, that she had a spirit of divination, that is she had a demon. And at the end of verse 16, it says she brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. Uh, the fascination about the future, the fascination about what's going to happen has always been around, hasn't it? People always want to know what the end of the book says without reading the book. They always want to skip to the end. And it was no different then than it is today. People that are looking to know the answers to the end will go to anyone they can that they believe has answers for them. And in this particular case, the, this demon-possessed girl uh, was duping people into believing she could tell the future. They couldn't, of course. Of course they couldn't. They were tricking people, just like today. Uh, you know, the palm reading, the, the tea leaves, and all the things that they do today, it's all demon-influenced, every bit of it. Uh, it. It's always made me laugh, you know, the psychic network. You would have think they would have known, if they were true psychics, you would have think they would have known they were going out of business. Yeah. It, it doesn't exist. It's just not real. But people still flock to it. Uh, loved ones, we got all the information we need right here. Yeah. This is all we need right here. Uh, and it was making her masters a lot of money. Sure enough, that they would pay for these false fortune tellings. The masters would get the money. They were taking complete advantage of the situation. And she was following Paul around in verse 17 and said, these men who are bond servants of the most high God, they're proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Well, she was right in what she was saying. She was telling, the, you know, in that sense, she was telling the truth. They are servants of the most high God. They were proclaiming the way of salvation. But here's the problem. She was saying it mockingly. She was walking around, oh, we got the goody two shoes with us today. Oh, we got the Christian. They're going to save your soul. Everybody listen up. Listen up. The Holy Rollers got something they want to say to. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. That's basically what she's doing. She's following them around and she's mocking them. Anything Satan can do to get people away from the message of the cross of Jesus Christ, he is going to do. Well, it says Paul had enough. It said he was greatly annoyed. You ever been greatly annoyed? Yeah, yeah. I just shared one of my greatly annoying moments with uh, with work, but um, yeah, you can only take so much. But the wonderful thing is Paul responded in the right way. Uh, not how we would probably respond. He responded correctly and he had had enough. He turned around 
And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And at that very moment, the demon came out. I, 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 really have to, I really have to touch on this just for a moment because this, this teaching is so prevalent today and I want you guys to know the truth. Nowhere in the Bible does it, does it tell us we have the ability uh, or, 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 or is there a command to cast out demons? It is not in the Bible. It is not in the Bible. You will not find it in there. And the only way a person can come to that conclusion is by taking scriptures out of context, jumping through all these different hoops, and then saying, see, there it is. Well, actually, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says twice in scripture, the command in James 4, 7, it says, submit therefore to God, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen. It does not say rebuke. It does not say cast out. It says to resist him and the devil will flee from you. Peter said the same thing in 1 Peter 5. He said, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So resist him firm in your faith. So what does it mean to resist him? We resist his lies with the truth of scripture. That's it. That's what the Bible says to do. Uh, it, 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 there is no command to cast him out. There is no command to rebuke him. Um, so that, that's enough said on that. I could spend hours talking about that. Uh, and, and let me clarify, because people always go, well, what if God wanted to? Hey, loved ones, God can do whatever God wants to do. Okay, if he wants to use you to, to if you will, cast a demon out, you know how he's going to do it? By sharing the gospel with that individual, giving them the gift of repentance, the Holy Spirit comes into their heart and into their life, and the demons got to go. Yeah. That's how he does it. That's our great commission, is to share the gospel. And when that person is born again, the Holy Spirit is not going to share a vessel with the demon. The demon's got to go. So, the Bible says to resist them. This was an apostolic uh, ability given to them by God to confirm the message and the messenger. So, look at verse 19. It says, but when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, isn't this interesting? They could care less about the girl. <laughs> they could care less about the girl. They're just upset they're losing their money maker, yeah. right? I mean, boy, these are, these are some loving people. Uh, when they noticed that the hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities, the word drag there is very violent. They, they were not asking them to quietly come along. Uh, there was bad intent with this. And the marketplace uh, in, in Gentile uh, cities was where they handled disputes and oftentimes uh, uh, decisions were made with magistrates, judges, etc. So they brought them to the place where the chief magistrates would be before the authorities, verse 20. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews. Now remember, this is, this is primarily a Gentile city. And are proclaiming customs, which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. The crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. My goodness, what a turn of events, right? Uh, lesson number two, suffering does not mean you're out of God's will. Suffering does not mean you're out of God's will. And you say, well, Scott, why are you saying that? Because there's actually people that teach when you're in the will of God, everything goes smooth. You ever heard that? Well, if you're in the will of God, there's no, there's no suffering, there's no trials, there's no difficulty. Everything's nice and easy. Everything flows along. Well, well loved ones, the Bible doesn't teach that and life experience doesn't teach that. Right. Paul and Silas have been nothing but obedient to God. They wanted to go to Asia. God said, no, they didn't force it. They wanted to go to Bithynia. God said, no, they didn't force it. God said, I want you to go to Macedonia. Immediately they were obedient and they took the, the vessel out to Macedonia. They're sharing the gospel. They're doing everything God asked them to do. As a result of preaching the gospel, they're beaten with rods. They're dragged into the marketplace. 
They're put in stocks, which by the way, the word literally means wood. And what it is, is it was a contraption where they would put your feet into it. They would spread your legs as far as they could beyond your ability to go. And they would fasten them in wood and lock it in place and leave you there. It was designed to, to cause excruciating cramping and pain. And they would leave you there. And it says they took them to the inner prison. That is, they took them to the most secure spot that there was. It was the deepest, darkest place of this jail. I'm sure it stank. You might as well say it was a dungeon. All of this because they were obedient to God. They were exactly in God's will, which brought about this suffering. So loved ones, if you ever find yourself suffering for being obedient to God, and it may not be at this level, it may just be people making fun of you. It may be, like I said before, it may be coworkers that no longer sit with you at lunch. They mock you every chance they get. They, they make snide little comments like, oh, praise God when you're around. Kind of like this girl mocking you, mocking your faith. That can be a form of suffering just because you're being obedient to God. Loved one, do you know what the Bible says to do when you find yourself suffering for your faith? It says rejoice, Amen. rejoice, for great is your reward in heaven. And then Jesus said, for they also persecuted the prophets which were before you. Now what that tells me is, it means we're in good company. We're in good company. They persecuted the Old Testament saints for following God. They persecuted the apostles for following God. Loved ones, they persecuted Jesus for being in God's will. No one was ever more in the will of God than Jesus. And the Bible says he was a man of constant sorrows. He suffered the cross by being in the will of God. So if you ever find yourself suffering just for being a Christian, don't let the lie start coming in that, oh, you must not be very loving. Otherwise, people wouldn't be coming against you. Jesus was the most loving person ever, and look how many people come against him. Oh, well, you must have done something wrong. No, you probably did something right. Don't, don't let that lie creep in there, but rather give God the glory and rejoice because you're suffering for the sake of righteousness, Amen. for the sake of Christ. Amen. And this is what we find with Paul and Silas. Their suffering didn't mean they were out of the will of God. It meant they were exactly in the will of God. Now, what's their response? <laughs> I can't help myself. Don't touch the Lord's anointed. No, you don't, you know, you don't know who you're messing with. Uh, verse 25. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there come a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. Really? That's what they're doing at midnight? Now let me remind you, they just got the pudding beat out of them with rods and they got beat so many times it doesn't even say how many it just says many blows and these were gentiles so the law of 39 lashes no more 40 lashes no more doesn't apply to them they can beat you with 139 if that's what they want to do and the implication here is, is that's what happened and then they're thrown into the stocks their legs are spread apart painful excruciating cramping they're in this stinky, dark dungeon. All they've done has been obedient to God. And here they are praying and singing hymns. They're worshiping God in the midst of their suffering. I mean, wow. You know, it almost seems unattainable, right? Yeah, I mean, we sit there and we think, what would I be doing in, in that situation? You know, we might be singing a different song. You know, gloom, despair, and agony <laughs> on me. Whoa, yeah. deep, dark depression. They say, you know, they are praying, and I have no doubt they're praying for the people that beat them. They're praying for the people that dragged them into the marketplace. They're praying for the jailer. I have no doubt they're praying for all of them, and they're singing hymns unto God. You say, how can they do that? Well, that's what they're doing is they're counting it all joy. That's what's happening here. And I wanna share with you four timeless principles that we can apply no matter what it is we might be 
going through. Principle number one, praise is not dependent upon our circumstances. Praise is not dependent upon our circumstances. Loved ones, if we have to wait for ideal circumstances before we begin to praise God, then that means we are fair weather Christians, not true believers. If we have to sit around and wait, and we say, okay, God, when everything is right, then I'll begin to glorify your name. Then I'll begin to worship you. I dare say we're probably not true Christians. Listen to a couple examples of what the Bible says. In Habakkuk, Habakkuk 3, he says this. He said, even if the fig tree does not blossom and there is no fruit on the vines, if the yield of the olive fails and the fields produce no food, that's a bad situation, right? They're going hungry. Even if the flock disappears from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls, no milk, no meat, no food, this is a bad situation. He says, yet I will triumph in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength and he has made my feet like deer's feet and has me walk on my high places. And what about Job? Oh my goodness. Everything he went through, lost his family, lost his home, lost his stock, lost his health. The guy lost everything. And then he, he says this in Job 1. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Loved ones, God is worthy of our praise regardless of the circumstances. Amen. He is worthy of our praise regardless of the circumstances. As a matter of fact, I have found, and I believe you probably have too, that during the most difficult times in my life when I worship God, it is more intimate than when things are going good. I find my worship of God to be more intimate during difficult times than when things are going good. There's something about a broken heart lifted up to God and saying, despite what's going on, you're still worthy of my praise. You're still worthy of worship. I worship you not because of the situation. I worship you despite the situation because you're worthy of it. The times when things are going bad and you don't feel like worshiping is exactly when you should begin to worship because our praise isn't dependent upon our circumstances. Number two, principle number two, our suffering is only temporary. Our suffering is only temporary. How many of you know for the believer, this is not our home? This is not, this is not the end of our destination right here. Now, let me clarify something. When I, when I say our suffering is only temporary, that doesn't mean we take on this sort of denial mentality of, oh, it's all good. It's all good. Just sort of deny it. Don't talk about it. Don't think about it. Therefore, it doesn't exist. That's not faith, loved ones. That's denial. The Bible doesn't tell us to deny, uh, to, to, to live in a state of denial with, with what's going on around us. Uh, it, it tells us that we can face the struggles. We can face the trials. We can face the heartache head on because we know the truth that there is a hope beyond our suffering because this is not our home. Loved ones, it's okay to hurt, but it is not okay to despair. Do I need to say that again? It's okay to hurt. There's nothing wrong with hurting. We're human and we're, we're designed, you know, that way. But the Bible says we do not despair before God. Despair means a lack of hope, right? Despair means there's nothing that we're looking forward to that transcends our pain, that transcends our suffering. And, and I love what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4. He said this, Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer person is decaying, yet our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction, <laughs> after everything he went through, he refers to it as momentary and light, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's where our eyes stay. That's where our focus is. 
on our heavenly home that we are all traveling towards, that while we, we still hurt, while we still feel the emotional pain, while we do not live in a world of denial, we face the struggles head on, in the midst of all that, we're able to say, hey, ultimately, this is only temporary. God is at work and there is something more glorious for me waiting for all of eternity. This is just a drop in the bucket. Oh, this is good stuff. Yeah. This is good stuff. That's where hope comes from. Yeah. We have a hope of a better day, a hope of a future where there is no more sin, no more sorrow, no more death. All of these things are going to pass away. So loved ones, at the end of the day, even in prison, it means you're free. Even in prison, it means you're free. Even in the darkness, it means you have light. Because this is not our home. Heaven is our home. Thirdly, uh, we can count it all joy because Jesus is with you every step of the way. Jesus is with you every step of the way. Like I said, he doesn't just sort of wind you up and set you off and say best of luck to you. Uh, I, I love what the preacher once said. He, he may have said it a little tongue in cheek, but it bears true. He said, Jesus didn't come to get us out of trouble. He came to be with us in it. He didn't come to get us out of trouble. He came to walk with us through the trouble. I love the Bible's promise. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let me ask you something. Have you ever told somebody you would never do something and then found out you wasn't able to keep that promise? See, I can't tell you oh, that something will never happen or, or I'll never do something. And, and I'll tell you why, because I can't control circumstances, right? right? I, I can't. I, I can tell you I'll never be late. I can't control traffic. If traffic is shut down, I can't help that. I can't control a flat tire. If I tell you I'll never miss one of your birthday parties, well, what if I get sick? I can't control that. You see, there's so many things that stops us from being able to say, I will never. But loved ones, there's nothing that can stop Jesus from saying, I will never. Because he's beyond circumstances, right? right? He doesn't get caught in traffic. He doesn't have flat tires. He doesn't get sick. He's the sovereign God of all creation and circumstances do not apply to him. Yeah. So when he says, I will never leave you, never forsake you, even in the midst of the most heartbreaking difficulty you can imagine in life. Jesus is right there with you. His arm is around you. And he's walking with you through it. Amen, Chris? Amen. Yes. Probably one of the greatest illustrations of that is in the Old Testament with Shad Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know the story. So Nebuchadnezzar set up a statue. When the music starts, bow down. They wouldn't do it. So he throws them into the fiery furnace. And if you'll allow me the Scott Rush version, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was sitting there going, wait a minute. Wasn't there three of them fellows we threw in there? Why do I see four and one of them looks like the son of man? Or, or depending on your translation, son of the gods, because he didn't know the one true God. He served many. So he knew there was some celestial being in there that was beyond just being a man and we know who it was. I believe with all my heart it was a pre-incarnate uh, visit of Christ. It was a pre-incarnate uh, Christ that he was, he was seen. He was with them in the, in, the, in the fire. And I love that picture. I love it. Because isn't it true, isn't it easy sometimes in our humanity, in our flesh, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the suffering, to forget Jesus is right there with us? To forget he cares? To forget he loves us? Is it not true the devil whispers in their ear, well, if God loved you, you wouldn't be going through this. God loves you right through it all, and he walks with you through it all. Certainly a reason to count it joy. Fourthly, we can count it all joy because our suffering can be our testimony. Our suffering can be our testimony. Notice verse 25. It says that they were praying and singing hymns, but notice what was going on. And the prisoners were telling them to keep it down. The prisoners were saying, we don't want to hear this. What's wrong with y'all? Uh, no, it says the prisoners were listening to them. How about that? 
In the midst of their suffering, the prisoners were listening. Loved ones, how many of you know if you're going to claim to be a Christian, people are going to watch you? They're going to watch you. And they're going to listen. And they're going to see how you respond to stuff. And during suffering, is when we have one of the greatest opportunities to say, yes, this is tough. Yes, it, 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 it's, it's tough. But you know what? God is with me. And he's walking with me every step of the way. And he's at work. And my trust is in him. Loved one, that is completely foreign to the world. That is a foreign testimony to anybody that does not know Jesus Christ. They are not used to hearing people give God the glory during times of suffering. And it can be a wonderful testimony to those that don't yet believe because they sit back and they go, how do you make it through this? God, the Holy Spirit living in me, the comfort of the word of God, that my, my family, all the things God has given me has helped me through this time. How do you have such peace in the midst? I'd be going great, God. Mm-hmm. Our suffering gives such great opportunity to witness to others. And, here, and here's an illustration Paul, uh, when he was writing to the Philippians, yes, it's the same city that that he would later write to. It's called one of the prison epistles. Paul was in prison when he wrote some of his letters, and and the Philippian letter was one of them. But this is what he said. Now, he was prisoned unjustly, just like he was here. He says, now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my circumstances, that is, being in prison unjustly, being beat, going through the same thing all over again, He said, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the Praetorian Guard, that is the Roman soldiers, and to everyone else. And that most of the brothers and sisters trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Two things were going on. Number one, people were hearing the gospel in the in the palace and the Roman guards were hearing it. Everybody was hearing the gospel more than they would have heard it if Paul wasn't in prison. And the brothers and sisters around saw how Paul was dealing with the suffering and they became more bold to share the gospel. This is amazing. Have you ever considered what you're going through as opportunity to share the gospel with others? I've I've heard Clinton say it. He he said, my suffering is my testimony. I've heard others allude to it. And it is true. When we're going through suffering, when we're going through difficulty, it's amazing how God can take that and use it to advance the gospel, to advance his kingdom. If one soul is saved as a result of our suffering, is it not worth it? But what if we took this selfish approach of, well, I don't want to go through suffering. Then you might miss out on some of the best things God has planned. You say, Scott, I don't know if I I like hearing this. I understand. Who of us likes to think about going through suffering? But the Christian can have hope and instruction during suffering when we consider these timeless principles that, that were true for Paul and Silas and is true for us today. And if our life is really focused on the kingdom of God, if our life is truly focused on living for Christ and advancing his kingdom, is this not cause to rejoice? Because when suffering comes, we can say, hey, I know these principles and I know what the Bible teaches and I have hope and I can actually use this as opportunity to share the gospel with others. Oh, this is good. Notice what happened, verse 27. It says, when the jailer awoke, now there's some, there's some discussion here. <laughs> there's some, there, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, some say he was asleep and the earthquake woke him up. Uh, maybe, you know, that, that's probably a pretty boring job. You know, you slap him in the dungeon, you leave him there, you go sit at your desk. What else do you got to do? He probably was angry about pulling jail duty. You know, he'd rather be out, you know, in the courtyard or something. Um, some of them say the, the earthquake debris hit him, knocked him out. That's a little bit of a stretch, right? I think the guy was catnapping. But anyhow, when, he, when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. And that day, if you was a Roman soldier and you was responsible for prisoners, if they escaped, you would be executed in whatever fashion they were supposed to be executed. 
So if they were waiting to be crucified, you would be crucified. If they was gonna be beheaded, you were beheaded. So he thought, I'm a dead man. I don't wanna die the way they were going to. I'm just gonna take my own life. Verse 28, but Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Wow. Amen. Not get back in your cell. I'm not going to tell you again. None of that. God just got a hold of him. And he said, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. I mean, this is great. God denied Paul Asia temporarily, right? God said no to Bithynia because he wanted Paul to come to Macedonia. The Philippian church was gonna be planted. Lydia and her household was gonna be saved. Guess what? There was more salvation to be had. This jailer and his household. God knows what he's doing, right? So, so, so more salvation, more of the kingdom of God beginning to spread. And now the kingdom had, has broken into the ranks of, of the, the Roman soldiers. Now the kingdom of God is in the prison. Oh man, I, I, can't, I can't wait to talk to this guy. What happened after that, you know? I mean, so many people we got to talk to about these things. But once again, we see the sovereignty of God at work that all along God knew what he was doing and all along God had a plan for Paul and, and Silas's suffering. Have you ever considered that when you're that when you're suffering, especially as a Christian, it's part of God's plan? And he has something greater in mind? Perhaps the salvation of others as a result of what you're going through? Loved ones, if we can learn to view our lives as being completely in the control of our Heavenly Father, how much hope does that bring us during difficult times? It brings me great hope. It brings great instruction in Scripture on how to handle these things. So here we have more salvation, more of the kingdom of God spreading, all as a result of Paul and Silas suffering. Now, we'll close up here with the last part. Verse 35. Now when day came, that means none of them slept. They spent the whole night praying, rejoicing, saving, washing, baptizing, eating, all of this stuff. Now when day came, the chief magistrates, not knowing what happened, sent their policemen saying, Release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. So the idea here is that after eating, after cleaning them, after doing all that, well, he had to bring them back, right? He took care of them, but he had to bring them back to the prison. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean he put them back in the stocks, but they, they had to come back to the prison. So. He says, come out now, come out, of, come out of your prison cell and go in peace. That was probably good news to Paul and Silas. Hey, let's get out of here, you know? Um, but that's just not what happened. Look at verse 37. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans and have thrown us into prison, and now are they sending us away secretly? No, indeed. Or if you'll allow me, I don't think so. <laughs> but let them come themselves and bring us out. Now, there's a few things happening here. Number one, Paul just put the fear of the Lord into all the magistrates. Because when he said, I'm a Roman citizen, which him and Silas were, rule number one, you do not beat Roman citizens, otherwise Rome will execute you. It was a law that, that Romans had. If you was a Roman citizen, you did not suffer those types of things. Otherwise, you were gonna be executed for it. Worst case scenario. Best case scenario, Philippi would lose their self-governing rights and Rome would take over. They would probably put the magistrates on some deserted island somewhere 
to fend for themselves. That's best case scenario. Uh, and secondly, Paul is setting a precedence here. And this is really important because Paul knew that the church had just been born in Philippi, right? The church just began to exist. And if Paul allowed this precedence to be set that the magistrates could treat Christians any way they want to without any fear of consequences, uh, then, then that would have been bad for Lydia and her household, for the jailer and his household. It would have been in their minds, well, we'll shut them down immediately and there's nothing they can do about it. Paul is letting them know, be careful how you treat Christians because it's not going to be allowed uh, and, and Paul is protecting the church by doing this. He's protecting Lydia and the household and the church that's gonna soon begin to grow. He's not being rebellious, he's not being obstinate. He, he is setting the precedence here and getting the message to the magistrates that's not gonna happen. And, and notice the response of the magistrates, verse 38. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, now notice this, they keep beg, they kept begging them to leave the city. These guys want them out of their hair now. We want y'all out of here. I mean, please, pretty please, pretty please with sugar on top. Well, y'all get out of here. Because they just realized we messed up. Bad. And we want them out of here. And hey, you know what? The Christians, okay, you, you guys do y'all's thing. All right? Verse 40. They went out of the prison. And what do they do? They entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So Paul's letting Lydia know what happened. He's encouraging them. Do not fear. Continue in, continue in Christ, continue to share the gospel, continue to be the church, continue to trust God in all of these areas, but be encouraged that even if this happens, God is in control. Even if you suffer for Christ's sake, God is in control. I have to believe Paul prayed for them, encouraged them in all of these ways, gave them instruction on what to do when he leaves, and then he departed. Well, loved ones, this, this is about as happy an ending as you can get, right? To his, to his visit to Philippi. And, and the, these principles are true for us today. They're true for us tomorrow. They're true for us for the rest of our lives. It's not if we suffer for being a Christian, it's when we suffer for being a Christian. And these principles will give us hope and instruction as Christ walks with us through them. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you uh, for the word that you have given us that we may have hope. We thank you for the scriptures that were written, that even today we can read through them and, and be encouraged and have instruction. So Father, thank you for these timeless principles that we saw today, that this is not our home. Our home uh, is with you in, in your eternal glory. And Father, we have hope today by knowing that our suffering is temporary. We have hope today knowing that we are in good company when we suffer for your name. Lord, we can have hope because you walk with us. Father, we can have hope because our circumstances are not dependent upon our praise for you. So Lord, take these truths, I pray, and encourage those that are going through difficulties even now. Help them apply these truths and meditate upon them in their hearts and in their minds and establish it, Father, as a firm foundation for their hearts and their minds. And Father, for those that are, that are in a good place right now, we give you the glory. And I pray that as preparation uh, for the days to come when difficulty arises, uh, that they too can still have these foundational truths that they rest upon and hold as true and dear. So Father, bring glory to your name, we pray, and all we say and do uh, for your glory and for Christ's sake, for our good, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.